Oh, my favourite Australian smell. God! There's a few. Are you sure I can't do my top 20? People talk about how kookaburras laugh, and that's, like, one of the first things you can hear in the morning. Like, I think a distinct Australian experience is walking to school in the morning and hearing, like, all the different birds and stuff. When I was a kid, when I used to play cricket, my first bat was a kookaburra bubble. And that was, um, that was really cool. I mean, I was born sort of near the rainforest and I love that, that sort of smell. When you go on a bushwalk. I don't know enough about Phylap, but I would say that the mob is involved. Um, that's what I've heard. But he also had a really big heart. A bushwalk, you're sort of really right in the, right in the, the thick of things. You're walking between two huge rocks and you'll you'll feel the squelch of mud. I do think Australians are very funny. I generally think Australians are some of the funniest people in the world. And not even just the comedians, just regular Australians. I think American people think English people are geniuses. And they think Australians are stupid. <laughs> Is that rude to say? But do you know what I mean? An Australian will say something like amazing, like they'll be doing like an equation. And the American will be like, oh my God, what do you say? What? And then the English person will be like, where's the toilet? And they're like, he's a genius. Oh my God. What do you think of when you think of Australia? For me, it's this YouTube clip. And today I was going to show you something that as a kid growing up we always used to have when we went down to visit my grandparents on the coast and it's just something so delicious and simple and easy and it's just something that we love here in Australia. It's called a chip buddy. It tastes great. It's full of fat and fibre and it's going to get your mouth watering. So let me show you how to make one. Come on. And he proceeds to make a french fry and butter sandwich. I've watched this video dozens of times since it was posted nine years ago. Seeing a person so proudly explain how to put french fries and butter on a roll locally called Chip Buddy genuinely shocked me. It's not fair, but it has colored the way I envision Australia, a place I've never been. Fly 22 hours, and this will be waiting on the other end? That's okay. I will see an emu at the zoo. $1,000 for airfare? How about I pirate a season of Bluey? In the past couple of years, however, I've gotten to know some Australian comedians, and I thought the talking with them could be an opportunity to move past the chip buddy to a deeper understanding. Maybe not that deep, but I figured I'd call them up and see what they like most about where they are from. But first, here's a few facts to get us going. The current president of Australia is Bluey. Sorry, I'll be serious. I, they make it hard. I watched a documentary on Australia, and here's the first line. Australia, the driest inhabited continent on Earth. It could have started with anything, but here's a brief overview. The name Australia is based on the Latin of Terra Australis, meaning Southern Land. The first people are said to have moved there around 50 to 60,000 years ago and have created one of the oldest and richest continuous cultures in the world. Over 300 languages or dialects are currently spoken, including 45 indigenous ones. It is the sixth largest country in the world and the Australian Alps received more snow than Switzerland. However, they are more famous for their 10,685 beaches 
and they even have the world's largest sand island called Fraser Island. Annually, they drink an average of 680 bottles of beer per adult. Surprisingly, that only earns them the 17th spot worldwide. The main industries are mining, agriculture, they got the world's biggest uh, cattle station, manufacturing, banking, and bluey. They rank highly for quality of life and have some of the best air quality in the world. There's some really nice crisp air, yeah. It's really good. Says Sam Campbell, one of the funniest comics I know, who is an Australian now living in the UK. It's like nice rain, like if water, the best water can ever smell, like so, just so pure and so innocent. It smells quite natural everywhere you go, even in Sydney, because um, because there's such a focus on um, the bush and making sure there's bush everywhere. That's Aaron Chen, who moved to the U.S. a few months ago with the hopes of someday appearing on the Showtime channel. I asked him what he missed most about home. About Australia? A lot of the um, chocolates in Australia, the, the composition of the chocolate is, uh, is, is milk. And um, so I sometimes miss a really milky chocolate. Australians are really big into milk. Um, we uh, we got a lot of cows. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of place that you can have cows and make milk. I reckon cow related stuff is like one of our big uh, biggest uh, exports. So yeah, we we do love we love this stuff. If you look at the ingredients list on chocolate bars in Australia and in, and in America, the American ones, the first ingredient is sugar. And in Australia, the first ingredient is milk. I asked Guy Montgomery from New Zealand to verify these claims and to offer his perspective. We have a chocolate called Frito Frog, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah. But in Australia, they had the Frito Frog, but they also had the Caramello Koala. And um, I remember thinking that was pretty good. We don't have any sort of novelty-sized chocolate bars built around our native animals. The the caramel koala. So it's similar to the Frito frog in its outer shell in that it's chocolate, milk chocolate. But um, it's different in its shape because the Frito frog is modeled on a frog. Okay. And the the caramel koala. Yeah is modeled on a koala. Yeah. But that's a decoy for the real difference, which is the um, sort of smooth caramel filling that they've got inside of the caramel koala. When you're from, in this part of the world, Australia, or in your part of the world, America, your chocolate bars, those are the default setting. Yeah. So when you go to Canada, you think, these guys are doing it wacky. Right. But in New Zealand or Canada, a lot of what we're consuming and receiving is transmitted from the bigger country. Yeah. So when we go to Australia, I don't think, oh, they've got this ice cream or bizarro. I think, well, this is how the ice cream is meant to be. Hmm. That's gotta be kind of a strange thing to consider. Are we the wacky ones? Are are we doing it wacky? (laughs) Well, this is, you know, I think this is an inflection point that every person in country has to come to at some point. Yeah. Everything's wacky to someone. And so when they have a rooster that they don't want, they will leave it on this like weird corner, like when you drive through, you know, through the bush. And there's this, this like quite a sharp turn. And there's just all these roosters that live there that have all been sort of outcast. And there's one cat that lives amongst them. Nothing wrong with a bunch of blokes just having a good time. (laughs) Definitely not. 
Australia's probably got one of the best collections of native birds of any country in the world. Do you have a favourite? Um, it's kind of obvious, but the kookaburra. In Australia? In Australia, maybe um, maybe the rainbow lorikeet. That's a beautiful bird. It's uh, very multicoloured. But I think a rare one, I like more rare one, but that's like really nice to see is the kookaburra. That's that's like a top bird, I think, because it's, I don't know, it looks like, it's almost like a dog because it kind of has um, different features to regular birds. I think the head's kind of bigger than, because you know how birds, they normally have little heads, but it kind of has a big head. It's really like, it looks like fluffy, I think. And it's got like blue, blue on it. This is a beautiful bird. Cassowary is this insane. It's a blue bird with sort of a red jowl and a huge spike on its head, like this insane, almost like if they put the top of a shovel on its head. And they're pretty, they're pretty outrageous. They're sort of nasty and prehistoric. But I think most of the animals are pretty kind. Do you have an Australian hero that you look up to? Sir Joe Bjorki Peterson. Who's that? No, that's, I'm just kidding. Oh. He's, he's, actually, he's, actually a, he's actually a real crook. <laughs> you don't want to have him in. <laughs> that's just a... Um, geez, I don't, yeah, I guess Farlap, I guess, those, or They're all pretty good. Um, Grant Hackett. They're all good. Farlap was a horse that the bigger... The, Actually, he's some of Farlap, I think, is in America. Maybe his hide. So basically, his heart. He just he did really well all over the world. He's a famous horse. He was huge. I think his heart is in New Zealand. His skeleton is in Australia. I think I'm getting this wrong. And his hide is in America. Wow, how big was he? He was huge. He was so big. Instead of having a jockey, he was ridden by another horse. That's what happens when you interview comedians. I never heard of Farlap before, so I looked him up. Spelled P-H-A-R-L-A-P, the Thai or Shuang word for lightning flash, I saw he certainly was a big horse, and he was kind of like an Australian sea biscuit, or, as Guy pointed out, Farlap was born in... um a small part of New Zealand called Timaru. A lot of Farlap's accomplishments took place in Australia. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, he learned everything he knew about being a horse in New Zealand. Interesting. This is a New, Ze- this is a New Zealand horse. I can understand that's contentious then. If you managed to get your hands on a recording of his neigh, you'd know that was a New Zealand horse. Like Seabiscuit, this New Zealand-born Aussie champ was a Depression-era horse that inspired the people. Seabiscuit was actually one of the most reported on subjects in 1938. I guess back then, when people were going through a tough time, they looked to fast horses for hope. Unfortunately, I can't think of a horse in my lifetime who's been quite as popular or inspiring. The close is probably The Horse from Babe, itself an Australian film. Perhaps we need the fast horse who can bring us together now. Dominate the headlines. Make us all cheer. Getting back to the story, Farlap was a chestnut gelding almost overlooked, but went on to win the Melbourne Stakes and Melbourne Cup. A very big deal. The Super Bowl of Australian horse racing, I'm told. Farlap then took a boat to North America, racing in Mexico and the US with a record of 37 of 51 wins in a four-year career. Farlap was a source of pride to the Aussies. Of course, The American mob was not so excited about this Australian horse coming over and upending the odds, 
so there was even a drive-by shooting attempt on Farlap's life. When Farlap collapsed and died in the arms of his trainer, Tommy Woodcock, in 1932, the mob was suspected of poisoning Sam's hero. Not everyone believes this, despite Farlap having an inflamed stomach and arsenic in his system. This could have been from the horse tonic he was regularly given, comprised of arsenic, streisine, cocaine, and caffeine. But others blame uh, some grass he ate, which could have been treated with insecticide. However, as you know, after 12 episodes, this is not a true crime podcast. We're not going to figure out what killed this horse, and even if it did, it wouldn't bring Farlap back. So let's just celebrate him like the Aussies and Kiwis do. Well, he was assassinated. Um, he was poisoned. So I'm, he inspires me to always watch my back and to be careful. <laughs> that's, good. that's a good message. Yeah. Aaron is pretty good friends with Sam, so I asked him why Farlap might be such an inspiration to him, since, as we know, comics might hide some truth at the bottom of a joke. If I were to take a guess as to why Sam said that, it's because um, he's in love with creatures, and um, creatures form a big part of his like uh, imagination, and I think maybe Farlap is like maybe the leader of all Australian creatures. Wow. That's, yeah. a, that's a great theory. I always thought that, that it was going to stump us, but that makes sense. He's a vegetarian and an animal lover. Why wouldn't he love the biggest Australian horse? And he also loves betting on horse racing. Does he really? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think so, but um, <laughs> but maybe... I found it nice that despite the rumored rivalry between their two countries, a New Zealander guy had mostly positive things to say about Australia. In Sydney, they've got the city beaches, the beaches they have access to just in their city. You can put them anywhere in the world. They'd be one of the most beautiful beaches you've ever seen. But in Sydney, these are just the beaches that are down the road. And so... You can go for a very nice swim in a huge, huge body of salt water, really easy. And the water's warmer too. The whole place is warmer. Do you like to go for a quick dip or do you go out there and float for a while? It varies. It's actually, this is another unique point between New Zealand and Australia. Because the water temperature is colder in New Zealand, I'd say I probably spend less time in the water. I go out. I get under, I try to get under three times for every swim, at least, even if it's freezing. Mm -hmm. But in Australia, you can go out and you can float. Although, actually, last time I remember trying to float in Australia, my two friends who were Australian were making fun of me because I couldn't float very good. The most relaxing thing about Australia is um, the summer break between uh, Christmas and um, New Year's and uh, maybe even a few days afterwards because people get a lot of time off work and everyone's going to the beach and like you can just spend um, a whole day at the beach you'll bring some food and drinks to the beach and lay on the rocks or lay on the sand or whatever and um, you'll just go into the water and come back out, maybe read a book and stuff like that. It's uh, These are long, long days and um, you have nothing to do apart from maybe go out to dinner afterwards. It's, it's truly beautiful. My body, my legs and my arms and my torso and my butt keep sinking down. Huh. Don't take it personally. It's nothing you're doing wrong. It's just the way you, you're made. What you know, it was hard not to take it personally when these two Australians were making fun. Yeah. Because they were making fun of me. Mm -hmm. Not even my body type. All right. Let's leave Guy on the beach for a moment to contemplate his lack of buoyancy and visit Yaram and Thorn, another comedian who lives by the airport. 
what you mean. No, I'm sorry. I'm, it's what you're, I'm sorry. Would you mind repeating that? You, I think something happened with the phone. There was. I'm just under a flight path, unfortunately. Oh. Um. We had to take a few breaks while the planes went over. He's like he's a fishmonger in Britain, and he goes around the world trying. Um, <laughs> is that another airplane? Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> um, which airport are you by? Kingsford Smith, I think it's called, like the big Sydney International. I think we've only got one. Has living underneath the airport changed your perspective on air travel? Um, no, I've always lived under it, under the flight path. Your entire life? Pretty much. Not ideal for a podcast, but it gives me the opportunity to mention a great Australian film called The Castle, which follows a family that also lives next to an airport. Talking to Yaraman made it feel all the more real. So you've never had a time in your life when you hadn't heard air airplanes all night? I barely registered them. Like, people will come over and just be like, how do you stand this? And it's like, closed captions. <laughs> as much as I like talking about airplanes, Aaron connected me to Yaraman because his family is indigenous, and I was hoping he could tell us a bit about the dreaming. It'd be a shame not to touch on it during the sleep podcast. I guess it's hard to ask for a simple explanation, but if people have never heard of it before how would you start to describe it uh, i guess i'd be like it, it's like a, a belief system um that would include like spiritual practices and like uh because uh we have no like kind of written language it's all passed down orally yeah it's a lot of like storytelling um it would be a, be a belief system, I guess, that would um, kind of connect Aboriginal people to their land and and their cultural identity. Neat. Do any stories stick out to you in particular? Um, I like. I'm a sucker for Tiddalik the Frog. <laughs> what is what is Tiddalik the Frog's story? It's uh, it's like a, it's about a giant frog called Tiddalik, who um, woke up really thirsty one morning and then uh, goes to the water hole and drinks all the water and falls asleep. And then the other animals kind of get around and realize the water's gone. So they kind of, uh, an owl devises a plan to, that if we can make uh, Tiddalik laugh, he'll spill out the water and we can drink again. And uh uh, in, in certain versions, there's like a kookaburra is trying to tell a funny joke, and it's just like everyone's bombing except for like an eel who does like physical comedy, like turns themselves into funny shapes. Do we get like a, a like a, a standing ovation from uh, Tiddalik the Frog? That one always made me laugh. Do you think in some way Tiddalik the Frog might have inspired you to do comedy? Uh, I think in a way, I think I, I always wanted to be that eel. I feel like I got a lot of kookaburra gear, like not a lot of love. <laughs> With all the planes going overhead, it was hard to prevent the conversation from drifting back to what it's like to live by the airport. Um, how often would you say the planes go over your place? Um, I reckon once every 20 minutes. Oh, that's not so bad. Not too bad. Sometimes it's a bit more. Do you have a, 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 a partner right now? Uh, yeah, yeah. But she lives um, she lives in a couple of suburbs over. How did she adjust to it? Um, completely fine as well. She kind of grew up in the same um, series of suburbs where I kind of grew up in. So it's just kind of just what you you put up with here that's beautiful someone who grew up close to the airport meets someone else who grew up close to the airport the rest is history
We'll have to revisit the dreaming another time in more depth because it is very fascinating. But for now, what do you think? Should we fly over Yarman's house to visit Australia? I asked Aaron's advice on this, but you can decide whether to trust him because he did just move away. Listeners should definitely travel to Australia. It's a very long flight, six, 16 hours from New York to Auckland, and then four more hours to Sydney. But uh, some of the things you'll see are truly beautiful. You get to go to the beach a lot. You'll get to go to the bush. You, you get to maybe see a lot of the natural sites. You want to spend a lot of time there because um, from city to city, it changes a lot. But uh, I think there's uh, beautiful food everywhere, beautiful produce and stuff like that. You'll love it. It is a big trip, so I, I don't blame you for, for not going. But um, but if, if, if the, any of that sounds nice to you, you should, you should definitely check it out. And a final word from Sam. We're serious people, and we've got some big plans. We've got some big designs. <laughs> there you have it. If we don't visit them, they will be coming for us. Music by Cutworms. Sound design by Ryan Dan. Guest appearances by Sam Campbell, Aaron Chen, Guy Montgomery, and Yaraman Thorne. I highly recommend you check out their work. Sam and Aaron have stand-up specials on YouTube, and Guy has one coming out on February 11th. Produced by Grant Farsi for Chestnut Walnut. Thanks to our patrons for making this episode possible, but especially to Alexis Y, Joe M, Stuart H, Randy M, Jessica W, Danny C, Jason C, David S, Philip B, and Victoriana. And truly, thank you to everyone who supported us. It's been a wonderful year talking you to sleep, and this concludes season one. We'll be back, but I want to leave you with a scene from Guy's Backyard. I'm looking outside right now. I can see all manner of birds. Where I live, we're lucky enough to have a plum tree. Hmm. And it's, it's dripping with plums that are just about ripe. Wow. But... It doesn't have any protection over it. I'm looking at a, a bird right now. I'm looking at a starling. There's a plum. It's picked off the branch onto the grass. And it's just having a full plum for breakfast. Wow. Yeah. But why would I want to have one of these as a pet when they're living such a good life? I agree. We can hear, I can hear them, by the way, in the phone. Ah, oh, that's nice. Very nice. I think it will be very nice for people to hear in the podcast as they fall asleep. Do you mind if we just listen for a second to the birds? Not at all. Zealand birds eating plums. <laughs>